Hi everyone. Today I want to show you how to etch small patterns in glass using hydrofluoric acid. And my main reason for wanting to do this is that I want to be able to make tiny optical components in or on glass surfaces and etching is one of the options to do that. So I thought I'd give this method a try. Now whenever the name hydrofluoric acid or HF comes up it leads to discussion about safety and for good reasons actually. But despite the dangers, it's still frequently used because when you want to do cheap and fast etching of glass, there really are no good alternatives. Anyway, in my opinion, you can work with basically any hazardous substance as long as you take the right precautions. But of course, in order to do that, you need to know where the risks are exactly. So that is why I want to spend the first few minutes of this video discussing the risks of working with hydrofluoric acid. One of the things about HF is that it's not just an acid but also a poison. And if we look at the median lethal dose, which is the amount of substance that will lead to acute death in 50% of the cases, the value is 20 mg per kilogram of body weight. So for an average person of around 75 kilos, this is equivalent to about 1.5 grams, which really isn't that much. And from that perspective, the half-filled bottle that I have here contains enough material to kill over a hundred people easily. But by itself, that is not very impressive for a toxin. In fact, take nicotine. Based on the LD50, it's way more poisonous than HF, yet people handle it on a daily basis. And it is not really easy to be exposed to an acute lethal dose of nicotine. The biggest problem of HF is actually the different ways that it can get into your body in hazardous quantities. So here is a list of don'ts when working with it. At first glance it looks like the advice you would give your teenage daughter before a night in town. But these guidelines also apply to HF. Now I guess from this list the advice of not drinking it and not getting it into your eyes is pretty obvious. Given that it's a poison and an acid. However. The inhalation and especially skin contact are the more sneaky aspects of working with HF. So let's have a quick look at these two. Let's start with the skin contact. If you consider a 50% solution of HF, it means that about half of it is just the pure stuff. So in a sense, it's almost a bit like liquefied gas. Now HF is a very small molecule and that is why it can diffuse quickly through, for example, skin or even through thin nitrile or latex gloves. For gloves to offer you any protection, you need pretty thick ones made of butoject or a comparable material. As for inhalation, concentrated solutions of HF will release significant amounts of HF vapor over time. Partly because the boiling point of pure HF is only 19.5 degrees Celsius, so right around room temperature. And for this reason you want extremely good ventilation and in the previous video I showed how I build a special fume hood to work with unpleasant substances like HF. The main danger of HF is actually not in its acidity because it's a fairly weak acid, comparable with for example citric acid. Instead the main problem is the fluoride ions. These can effectively bind to calcium which is a key element in many biological processes and cell functions. Now, the reaction of fluoride with calcium causes depletion of active calcium ions, which will cause many types of cells in your body to malfunction and eventually shut down and die. And because calcium also plays a vital role in regulating signals between nerves, you might not even feel pain. So exposure might therefore easily go undetected until much later when you notice your skin has gotten a different look and feel, and it's basically too late. With all the previous in mind, one would expect that ordering a bottle with a concentration of 48% would be subject to at least some cautionary measures. But no, not really. After ordering it in a web shop, it arrived in an unmarked box with the bottles tightly packaged between the cardboard sides. In fact, in such a way that external forces would be directly exerted on the bottle itself. Which given the state of the cardboard actually sort of happened during transport. So I contacted the supplier to give them some friendly advice on their packaging method. But they just waved away my concerns saying that it was completely safe because the bottles were UN approved. Sure, tell that to the guy in the delivery van. Before I started working with it, I made so called buffered oxide edge. Basically, 
This is HF diluted with an ammonium fluoride solution. I actually made a less concentrated solution than the standard. And the way I made it was by slowly adding a surplus of concentrated HF to a concentrated ammonia solution. And in addition, I added a small amount of chloric acid, since this is known to give smoother etching results by dissolving reaction products. So the main advantage of using buffered oxide etch is a constant and predictable etching rate. And this is because the etching rate is governed by the reaction at the glass interface rather than by transportation processes of reactants or reaction products. So by making the reaction rate the limiting step, the etching process becomes isotropic, meaning that it proceeds at the same rate in all directions. And this leads to very predictable etching results, contrary to when using unbuffered HF. And the latter case, convection and diffusion can be limiting factors, which leads to a different and especially less predictable etching profile. If you want to etch glass surfaces in a specific pattern, you need to partially protect the surface with a material that can withstand the etchant. And for this we have a few different options. We can for example use photoresist, which is a photosensitive polymer that can be applied from solution and can be patterned by using selective light exposure. But photoresist can protect the glass from HF only for a limited amount of time. And the reason is that because HF is such a small molecule, it can also quickly diffuse through the organic resist material which is generally only a few microns thick. Once the HF has diffused through the layer, it will start reacting with the glass and at that point the photoresist loses adhesion and releases from the glass. So the trick is to make photoresist thick and in addition make it adhere very well to the glass. Otherwise the HF can just creep directly between photoresist and glass from the sides. And here you see this effect in action where HF has gotten under the photoresist layer. Originating from these open rectangular areas, you see how this under edge damaged the glass surface quite substantially. An alternative to using photoresist directly is to use a patterned metal layer. One of the metals suitable for this is for example chromium, which forms a dense protective layer that cannot be easily etched by HF. In addition, chromium has a formidable adhesion to glass, so there's little risk of etchant creeping between chromium and glass. But of course the downside of using chromium is that the process is somewhat more complex. You first have to apply a thin layer of chromium, then etch it in the required pattern using photoresist, then etch the glass underneath the chromium and as a final step remove the chromium again. But to show you that this method works really well, I tried using an old photo mask that already had a very fine chromium pattern on it. So this is after etching when looking under a microscope. And by turning up the backlight level, you can actually observe the profile etched in the glass through the chromium because it's partly transmissive. What you see is that the pattern etched in the glass is wider than the openings in the chromium layer. And this widening on both sides of the track is equivalent to the etching depth due to the isotropic nature of the process. So here you see a comparison of the original pattern and the etching result. You can see that the central areas in the etched surfaces are flat and the edges are sloped gradually exactly like you would expect with isotropic etching. Also you observe some increase in surface roughness in the etched areas. However, it doesn't look too bad. But it gets more obvious with extended etching time. And here you see a cross section of the etching profile which was made by cutting up the sample. By the way, it also demonstrates one of the main limitations of isotropic etching which is that the maximum depth is always less than half of the width, which prohibits the etching of high aspect ratio structures. If you want to create structures with a higher aspect ratio than 0.5, you should resort to methods that use anisotropic etching. One of these methods is laser induced etching. And the way this works is that you use very short laser pulses, generally in the pico or femtosecond range, to very locally create structural changes in the material. These structural changes introduce a large difference in solubility between exposed and unexposed material. And in this case, you don't need to use HF, you can also use, for example, hot potassium hydroxide solutions as an etchant. Now, companies like Lightfab and LPKF Vitrion offer complete solutions and equipment for making high resolution and high aspect ratio structures in specific types of glass. It's very nice technology. 
but also quite expensive. So commercially available systems can quickly cost in excess of 300 grand, which means that I have to wait until August to ask one for my birthday. One of the most critical components of these systems is actually the laser. If you want to limit the effects of laser exposure to within a few cubic microns, you need a very short and well-defined laser pulse. Because if the energy is too high, the material will evaporate, basically explode and cause cracks and damages in the material. And if the pulse is for example too long, you cannot create the required amorphous structure or keep the structural changes contained to a very small volume. Now another aspect is that this method only works well on a very limited number of materials, preferably highly crystalline materials such as sapphire or quartz. It's much less selective for partly amorphous materials such as borosilicate or soda lime glass. And for glass ceramics, such as for example Zerodur, this method does not work at all. While trying to establish etching rates, I found that there is a huge difference between soda lime glass and quartz. With buffered oxide etch, the soda lime etched approximately 15 times faster than quartz. And I guess the main reason is that these two materials have large structural differences. The quartz is highly crystalline, whereas soda lime glass is largely amorphous. And in addition to that, the soda lime contains several percent of sodium and calcium, which are known to have a high reactivity towards fluoride ions. As I said in the beginning of this video, the goal of this exercise was to see how easy it is to make optical devices on glass, like diffractive lenses. So here's an example of such a structure. It's actually the structure of a diffractive lens similar to the one I used in a previous video on optical gates. Because the features here need to be in the order of a few microns, I used the process including the chromium as the intermediate step. So here you can see that with white light, these devices very nicely separate and focus the different wavelengths under various angles, just like an optical grating. However, if you want to etch structures smaller than a few microns, the unfavorable aspect ratio of isotropic etching will start working against you. Because, for example, in order to make a high difference of a micron, the lateral size of your features will generally be more than 3 microns. So that is why, apart from etching, I will also look into other methods in the future. But of course, the applications of etching are not limited to making optics. It seems nowadays that every tech channel needs at least one video featuring a Tesla valve. I'm not sure why, in fact, I myself don't know of any real world applications of these. But you know, who am I to question technology hypes? Especially because these things look quite sexy and high tech. So here's my contribution to Tesla valve mania, and of course, they are made of glass. And as others have said before me... So this is actually one of the smallest of these in the world as far as I can tell. Because at this level of magnification, they're actually too small to see. The things that you can make out are the much larger connection pipes to the valves. So again, we have to look at them under a microscope. And here they are. There are six of them between each set of connection pipes. They're about 300 microns long and have a channel width of 4 microns. Actually, these are way narrower than the smallest blood vessel in your body. So after the etching part, I added a glass cover slip on top of the Tesla valves and then created a quick surface connection using optical contact bonding. So what do you think? Will water flow easily through these? Well, let's find out. Okay, that happened very quickly. So let's take a look at that frame by frame. Due to the small dimensions and the capillary forces, these channels basically fill up within a fraction of a second. And do they work as Tesla valves? Sure, in my opinion, these look sufficiently sexy and high-tech. So that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it, and maybe it contained a few things that will be useful to you.